Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, of course, it's uh, Inspired Conversations with Craig. And um, well, look, uh, today I'm going to be sharing a website that I've been visiting uh, multiple times per week over the past six years. It's the Vitamin D Wiki. There it is on screen. And uh, I'm joined today by Mr. Henry Lahore. He is the uh, the founder of Vitamin D Wiki. There he is on screen. Uh, in this video, look, I'm going to give you an introduction to the Wiki. And uh, I'm going to probe this very knowledgeable man uh, about some commonly asked questions around vitamin D and uh, supplementation that I know will be uh, uh, of value to you if you're interested in exploring the literature. Uh, and we're going to wrap up with a, a philosophical round off uh, and a where to from here for you, for me, uh, for Henry uh, and the wikis. So uh, Henry, welcome to my podcast. And I've got to say thank you so much for uh, agreeing to come on and chat with me. Uh, now, I'm told uh, that you're a retired Boeing engineer. Tell us uh, a little bit about that. Uh, for the folks at home, a little bit about yourself and your background into the world of vitamin D. Sure. My um, background is electronics engineering and worked at Boeing, retired a few years ago, uh, had been interested in health all my life, been following many different nutritional supplements. I've probably tried over a hundred of them during my life. Uh, then uh, got started with vitamin D wiki because a person told me, uh, you knew I was interested in health, that uh, vitamin D was helping some people with back problems. And I've had back problems most of my life and uh, I investigated it and found that indeed it was helping tremendously. And so uh, in while I was retired, I proceeded to get into uh, uh, studying through vitamin D. And about a month later, I started vitamin D wiki. And now we've got uh, 13,000 web pages on vitamin D and other associated things on vitamin D wiki. Mm -hmm. So when did you found the wiki? When did it all kick off? Uh, it's about 2010 is the start date. Right. And uh, the motivation for doing it? Uh, I wanted to share with other people around the world what I had learned about vitamin D. Uh, I had been sharing other things with uh, some publications I made uh, under a rubric of uh, health prints, little uh, bits of information, pamphlets about health. And I wanted to share things in a non-paper way that I can share it around the world about uh, the how much people can get benefit from vitamin D. Mm -hmm. And so look, I know the wiki is just this amazing uh, place to find all the information on vitamin D. Uh, it, it's ranked by disease and disorder. Uh, tell me, how does the back end work? Are you like literally uh, spending all your time collating studies? Uh, and how many did you say were available? Uh, there are 13,000 studies uh, on the website. Uh, most of them are available as full text and uh, about 10% of them I expand the full text so you can see it and actually have it translated into any of 105 languages. But a uh, great number of them are, uh, the, uh, the rest of them are attached there. And I just will show the abstract. It tends to take me about an hour to three hours to extract an entire uh, study and put it on the web page. So I, I tend not to do that. I keep it more at like 10 minute level. Uh, I spend of the order of about 2,000 hours uh, each year uh, 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 at the master of the vitamin D wiki website. <laughs> or, and in terms of language, you did, uh, I mean, you know, I'm coming from New Zealand. It's a, a very diverse uh, society down this part of the world, Henry. Uh, we've got Maori and uh, a lot of uh, Asian Chinese speaking people. Uh, any one of those cultures can jump on the wiki uh, and view uh, any one of those pages uh, in their language. Is, is that correct? Yep. There's um, the translate, and then you can select the, num the languages that you want, us, want it to go to. Huh. There. So that's the list of languages. You just pick the language you want. And oh, 
to Bengali and there it's translate that page to Bengali or any of 105 different languages. And it's done that quickly. And yeah. switch it again to some other, to Arabic, for instance. Uh, th uh, that's absolutely unreal uh, in terms of connecting with a global audience. Now, uh, you know my background into vitamin D, uh, Henry, is cluster headache. Uh, is there a mechanism for me to just uh, look at everything relating to uh, cluster headache or, or migraine uh, disorder? Uh, so, you know, I'm not so much interested in um, some of the other aspects, just uh, headache. Uh, there's... Uh about 140 categories of information of, of health problems that I've gotten a lot of information on where vitamin D uh, is either involved in treating it or preventing it. Um, and anyone can look at those 140 items that will be shown a little later here in the interview. Right. Um, and look, tell me, how many people are flocking to the wiki uh, looking over your site? Generally, only about 40,000 people per month haven't re advertised it at all. They've got various methods of doing it, haven't had the time to do any uh, of the and, uh, out of curiosity, advertising. Out of curiosity, where are those folks coming from? Uh, generally from English speaking countries, but also got some from Spain and uh, seems as though some languages are being used from India, uh, Philippines. Uh, uh, I guess about 10% of them are from Germany. Um, so assortment of places, uh, I guess is of the order of about 40 countries. Uh, uh, people come visit the website, but the ones that uh, there's a top 10 of countries that are most frequent. Yeah. Um, how does, does New Zealand uh, appear on the list? Do you notice many folks from New Zealand coming in there? Uh, I have not noticed. Right. I only look at that about once a year. I say that because look, it's a, it's a conversation that's coming up uh, more and more down here uh, as people become aware uh, of the effects and benefits of vitamin D. Now, uh, before I start to pick your brains, uh, Henry, you're clearly a knowledgeable guy that's read uh, more papers on the subject, certainly than than I have. It's uh, it's a timely reminder just to say that anything we uh, discuss here, team, is um, certainly not to be construed as medical advice. It's uh, for your educational purposes only, and I uh, hope you take something uh, of value uh, away from it. Now, uh, before I get started on some of the questions I get asked all the time about vitamin D, uh, Henry, first, just tell me what is all this fuss about? You know, why is it coming up in conversations more and more? Uh, and is it actually worth having a conversation about? We wouldn't be having this conversation back in the 1970s. Most people around the world had a good level of vitamin D and were fairly uh, healthy relative to what's happening now. Uh, since that time, however, there, due to uh, over 20 reasons that I've got documented on the website uh, in detail, the vitamin D levels have been dropping or crashing uh, tremendously. We'll be showing that later on here in the interview. The, that uh, uh, the, the problems that uh, there used not to be a need to supplement with vitamin D, but now that people primarily are staying indoors more and are fearful of getting vitamin D from the sun, uh, they are causing a great number of other problems. Mm -hmm. And you've got an amazing five and a half minute video uh, that I have posted. You can check that out. Uh, and it gives you just the most amazing background into, uh, you know, into the world of, of deficiency. And um, and it would lead into one of my first questions uh, there, Henry. Uh, you know, the vitamin D uh, recommendations, what blood level should we be aiming for? And I can tell you uh, in New Zealand, and I'm going to bring up New Zealand uh, recommendations on screen yep. uh, for, for you folks at home. But uh, we've got recommendations that seem very low when you compare them to, um, you know, the endocrinological society's guidelines. And, and even then, uh, there are recommendations that, that differ from this. So uh, as an ordinary, everyday kind of bloke, 
like how am I supposed to navigate this and and where does the truth lie? I like to think of as I'm trying to tell this to different people, I like to think of what do other people around the world believe in a particular society, religion, uh, vitamin D level, uh, uh, calories, alcohol, whatever. What, if, what uh, not looking parochially at my particular country, but look at a wide variety of countries. So here in this chart that we're looking at, uh, New Zealand's on the second row, um, along with the Institute of Medicine, Australia, New Zealand, Nordic countries. That's, they're saying that uh, at 50 nanomoles uh, or uh, uh, 20 nanograms of vitamin D is sufficient. You're in the green region. Now, some other countries are to even lower. You can be at the 30 nanomoles uh, to be okay. Um, the, the United Kingdom is even lower than that. But if you look around at the various countries around the world and groups around the world, there's, you see that no, you can't get into the green level until you're about 75 nanomoles, which is 30 nanograms. Or some of them say you need even higher than that to be in a good region. Uh, I personally think it should be even higher than that. But I'm just, this is just a, a quick overview of there's almost an equal number of countries in each of those different categories where they think a certain level is okay. Mm, mm. And, and so in terms of, I mean, recommended daily intake, uh, again, down, down here in New Zealand, the recommendation is between 200 uh, and 400 international units of, of vitamin D. And, uh, you know, yep. the max, maximum potency, uh, I can tell you, uh, if you walk into a, a chemist pharmacy, is a, a thousand international units. Now, uh, I think the burning question is, um, at that kind of dose level, uh, is it significant enough to be able to uh, increase your vitamin D serum level uh, into the green range, uh, yep. like in, the, in that first table with the vitamin D council? Uh, so here, here's a summary of chart that I had looking at various recommendations around the world. I don't have New Zealand here explicitly, but it shows some of the others. And uh, the higher up you are on the chart, the, uh, some of them are at 2,000 IUs, and that there's uh, some groups that, that say that's quite adequate. Some groups say you want 4,000 IUs. Is, well, actually not adequate. This is, they're referring to this as the upper maximum. Some, so some say 2,000 maximum, uh, some say 4,000, some say 10,000 maximum. But in, in all cases, it's actually the maximum is far, far higher than any of these. But just showing you the position that various of the groups around the world have taken as to what is a good level. Uh, there's probably 40 some countries that have 2000 I use as the maximum to take. And that's all that can be sold by companies inside of that country. Later on, you'll see that uh, there's ways of getting a much larger doses of vitamin D to get uh, a good amount uh, by buying things internationally. Yeah, yeah, right. So, look, in my case, uh, uh, Henry, it's 80 nanograms per milliliter uh, in order for me not to get cluster headache attacks. And it's as simple as that. Now, uh, if I'd started off uh, like the average Kiwi uh, with a serum uh, around 24, 25 nanograms per milliliter, um, yep. would taking 1,000 or 2,000 international units of uh, vitamin D uh, get me to 80 nanograms per milliliter? Uh, putting it slightly differently, I rarely see a single study on any health problem that 1,000 IUs of vitamin D will help. Uh, 2,000 IUs, it starts to help on some problems, but things like cluster headaches, multiple sclerosis, uh, sleep problems, and others need much, much higher doses to, to achieve that. 
And, and so I guess then the question becomes why uh, the the why behind why regulate uh, the the maximum dose that one can purchase if um, these lower doses aren't going to touch or elevate your level up to uh, up to around what uh, the vitamin D council is now suggesting looks like optimal. It seems uh, like you end up taking away a, a person's choice to choose. Uh, you know what they do with their body it seems um, almost ridiculous to be fair many doctors like what's the tra- risk why are they the, doing this <laughs> they were it's based on a problem that came up in the 1950s in the united kingdom they had an outbreak of some problems and they thought it was due to the vitamin d in milk that they had recently given And they, at that point, then slammed down and said no vitamin D at all. And they greatly reduced how much vitamin D people could be having. Uh, Vitamin D was given to the tune of much higher doses, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 per day back in the 1930s with excellent help uh, to dental groups. There's quite a few studies of of showing how the American Dental Association was strongly recommending a good level of vitamin D way back then. But due to that uh, mistaken problem, which got perpetrated as being a problem in a great number of uh, medical textbooks that even up until two years ago is still saying that, oops, you could have toxic level of, of vitamin D if you have 2000 IUs due to that mistake that was bit done back in the 1950s. Slowly, slowly things are changing, but uh, that, that's the problem. Well, well I mean, the, um, the offshoot of that is, you know, I'm, I'm perplexed uh, at, the, at the situation behind it all, but, you know, you look at uh, this paper from the Journal of uh, Health Population and Nutrition's uh, one in seven of us uh, are now deficient in vitamin D, and that's you know, that's about a billion human beings. If the recommended uh, daily intakes are so low, uh, it kind of, you start to get a, an understanding of um, of why we have such a high level of deficiency uh, down here uh, in New Zealand. And again, uh, I've got a link uh, here for Kiwis that, um, uh, that want to have a look at that now. Uh, it, it, it really depends, Craig, on what your definition of deficiency is. Yes, about one in seven or 10 uh, are, de- are deficient if you have a very low level as to what you call deficient. But if you look it up at say 30 nanograms, if you're less than 30 nanograms, then it's around about 50% of the world is deficient. If you look at the level where you really should be in the way where people used to be at 50 nanograms, then it's more like 90% of the, of the world is deficient. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so one of the things um, that I hear all the time when, when people start talking about vitamin D is uh, you can get all the vitamin D uh, that you need from the sun. So, you know, uh, how much is enough sun? Uh, uh, and I, I prefaced that question, Henry, because I, uh, I was reading a review inter- interview article in the New Zealand uh, Stuff News publication looking at an increased risk of uh, melanoma because more women are opting for uh, G-string style bikinis. Uh, and the skin specialist went on to say that uh, spending uh, two sessions, five minutes per week uh, is adequate for vitamin D production. You know, is, is that enough? Not nearly enough. Uh, by the way, the main problem with uh, uh, skin problems, skin cancer and uh, vitamin D is when you go out there in the sun infrequently, and then all of a sudden you try and get a lot of vitamin D and the sun, your, your skin is not used to it. If you go at it more gradually during the year and just get more and more and more, as you would normally if, say, you're an outdoor worker, you don't have any problems at all. My dad was a carpenter, for instance, and he would have no skin problems whatsoever because he was gradually, as the months were going along, getting more and more sun, and uh, that builds up your vitamin D level in your skin. Once the vitamin D level in your skin is built up, it's able to deal with having more vitamin, more UV coming in. And so you have 
paradoxically less problems as you are more used to the sun. But people who only go out, say on the weekend and try to get all their vitamin D at the, that particular time, that doesn't work out too well. So in terms of, um, you know, consistency uh, of exposure, uh, more so than, you know, bursts uh, over the summer break. <laughs> right, right. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, okay. So for instance, that, the little chart I have there, it kind of works out that if, you're, if your target is in the lower left-hand corner, 10 nanograms of vitamin D, uh, then you probably... 10 minutes uh, will, will be enough for you per day during the summer. But if your target is more like 50 nanograms and you're trying to get it all from UV or from the sun, then it's more like 90 minutes that you have to have in order to get that 50 nanograms. Uh, and that's, not, that's per each day. That's assuming, as I say in here, that uh, it's a young person, white skin, lying down in a bathing suit. Uh, we're not all that way, of course, but. Uh, and gee, uh, you know, my, my um, eyebrows raised when I was reading the articles to, to suggest, you know, two, two kind of five minute sessions uh, was enough. And, uh, you know, my mother and grandfather both died from uh, melanoma. So it's, you know, it's not a conversation or a, a topic that I approach uh, lightly at all. And, um, uh, and it leads, I guess, on to my next question, because uh, I'll have a, a lot of um, uh, older folks, my, my mum's age uh, in their 60s and 70s, that perhaps watch this video uh, and uh, they're going to associate vitamin D with recommendations from their doctor uh, regarding osteoporosis. And uh, the classically understood function of vitamin D, of course, is uh, in the regulation and mineralization of, of calcium and phosphorus. C can you talk to us a, a little bit about that, uh, including uh, why everyone talks about calcium and uh, what is phosphorus and how does vitamin D kind of fit into that whole process? Um, I, I just noticed this morning, actually, that there were tw 20,000 20, published studies in the last decade on vitamin D in bones. Uh, so I will try to condense that down to a 30-second soundbite uh, that, yes, indeed, it's been noticed for a long time. It was first noticed... Uh, who? 1905, I think it was, that uh, vitamin D was uh, given to people with rickets that the rickets would go away. And then only 90 years later, people came up with a consensus that yes, vitamin D does stop rickets. Well, that was the, the first start there. And since then, they're noticing more and more that vitamin D allows the body to make better use of uh, phosphorus and calcium and vitamin K and magnesium and other things to build bones. Uh, it's, each of those things are needed, but oftentimes people are the most efficient in vitamin D. So there's, I think I have 300 studies now uh, on the left-hand column that you could look at on vitamin D and bone uh, that, uh, yes, indeed, it, it does help an awful lot. Mm. And, and if you could just briefly talk to the mechanisms so kind of people understand the, the sun hits the skin and, um, you know, right through to uh, the kidneys. Okay. Well. Um, it, yeah, the, the sun hits the skin and the, the body has learned to put a chemical on those parts of your body that will be seeing the skin. It doesn't put it through all your, your body, doesn't put it on your uh, the lower bathing suit part of your body, for instance, uh, but it puts it very heavily on your face and on your hands uh, and on your feet. Uh, and so you'll gain a lot of, when, when the sun gets the UV there, it, it creates a uh, vitamin D uh, in, in the skin. And then you, it, as it comes into the skin, it comes that one of these two pathways, either, well, the, the pathway here is the skin, the topical, or also you can get vitamin D that you can apply on your skin uh, rather than getting it uh, from the sun. It, it works pretty well, but then it gets processed through the body 
um, primary, uh, a lot of it gets processed through the body, uh, through many of the different cells in the body, but some of it goes through the liver and through the kidneys. That's the classic way that it was thought of as the only way of it was thought of 20 years ago that it was being processed in the body, but now it's found that majority, maybe 75, perhaps some, some people say 90% of it doesn't go through the kidneys or the, uh, the liver and kidneys, but it's processed locally in your muscles, and et cetera. Mm-hmm. So um, the kidneys, uh, are re- how does that whole process get regulated and how does the um, parathyroid glands kind of fit into that piece? The, the, the vitamin D generated either from you're taking it uh, as a supplement or from food or from sub- topically from the sun or whatever gets into the bloodstream and then uh, the, the classic approach is uh, considered is that the vitamin D then goes into the kidneys where it becomes the vitamin D molecule becomes semi-activated by having a little vitamin, little water uh, molecule added onto it. And then it becomes calcidiol, which is shown right here. And that's what you actually see in your blood test uh, is the, the amount of vitamin, the, the level of vitamin D that you see coming out of the liver and seen in the blood test is shown right there. Now, after that, the uh, it proceeds on further, and it can be used right there by the body, but some of it uh, is needs to be, uh, another water molecule needs to be added on uh, that gets involved in these two genes, and then it becomes calcitriol, which is the fully activated um, vitamin D that which gets, can be brought into the cells and used by the cells. Uh, and, and so uh, it's either um, the, uh, calcitriol is either uh, made by the kidneys uh, cl- in the classical pathway of, of regulating calcium uh, and phosphorus. Right. Uh, but above and beyond that, um, we, you know, we now know that um, uh, vitamin D is, uh, not only processed by the kidneys, but uh, many other cells uh, yes. in, the, in the body. And and is that kind of where the magic uh, it comes into play? And uh, is that how it works? Uh, I mean, to say that uh, a lot of people say um, vitamin D is not a vitamin, it's a, it's a hormone. So uh, I guess the pathway that you're showing there shows that um, uh, sunlight's converted into... Uh, pre-vitamin D and then taken to the liver where uh, yep. uh, 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 hydroxyl group is added by an enzyme uh, and then that is the blood storage form but uh, from there it's not only the kidneys that will convert that calcium trial to regulate calcium and ensuring you don't get rickets uh, but also uh, the other cells in the body uh, possess the ability to grab hold of that storage form uh, of vitamin D and use it for their own requirements. Right. The, uh, most of the cells in the body can actually process the vitamin D as it just originally generated at the top of this slide. Uh, in that form, it can be processed by the cells or it can, uh, it can grab it right there. And in the cell, this, this is the description of the cell. The cell can take that and make it a calcidiol and use some of the parts of the body, uh, the immune system uses this form of vitamin D and most of the vitamin of the parts of the body uses this form of vitamin D, the calcitriol uh, form of vitamin D. But all of that can be done locally without any uh, kidney or liver involvement whatsoever. Right. And, and that's what people, um, uh, physicians mean when they, when they say that, uh, you know, the vitamin D receptor uh, is uh, evident in, in not just many cells, but most cells. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, really. It, the vitamin D receptor has been around for some people say 750 million years uh, that animal forms before they were even having cows, before they're having skeletons, were, were using the vitamin D receptor. Uh, so it, it's been a, a popular thing to have for most animals. 
Yeah, I mean, I've heard um, other doctors and researchers, uh, Dr. Gomenet kind of talks about how uh, you know, vitamin D is, is indeed one of the oldest hormones on the earth and enabled our sea bound ancestors to be able to um, develop and uh, migrate onto the land uh, and mineralize calcium and their skeletons carried around with them, drawing on it when they don't have any available in their diet and adding to it um, when they're able to through that regulation of sunlight into uh, pre-vitamin D, vitamin D, and then it's uh, active form. It's just, um, it really is uh, a r- interesting background into the subject. Another little factoid here is that uh, many animals, including humans, uh, have learned how to store vitamin D because they can be in environments, the winter or in a rainy season or whatever, and the which they don't get vitamin D every day. So the body has learned how to properly store that. So it makes use of it when it's available. Kind of like the camel uh, storing water. Uh, we store vitamin D, but we don't get a big lump because of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, understanding that uh, vitamin D uh, can be used by many of the cells uh, in the body. You know, what's the benefit, uh, Henry? Uh, I mean, most people say, well, who cares? Uh, but but what is the benefit of the cell being able to use vitamin D uh, in terms of health outcomes? Here's a list of... Okay, there have been a lot of randomized controlled trials in which people having various health problems... Uh, half of the people were given, in this case, 50,000 IUs of vitamin D every two weeks, and half of them were given a placebo in which there was no vitamin D inside of the pill whatsoever. And so this shows the 27 health problems that have been tr- proven to be treated, prevented or treated, I use the word fight, uh, by vitamin D. Um, so and that's just under this particular amount of vitamin D, 50,000 I use vitamin D once every two weeks. Uh, yeah, and, I, I, uh, I mean. On, on, so on the website, which is meant right here, you can click on it and get the, the full details of how much of uh, fighting that was involved with, by having 50,000 I use of vitamin D. Uh, yeah, I mean, looking at that list, Henry, uh, here in New Zealand, that list, ha- you know, has got some um, uh, heavy hitters in there. I-, I tell you, breast cancer, colon cancer, uh, prostate yes. cancer, those things are going to ring a note uh, with people. Um, uh, you know, endometriosis uh, is something that is going to strike a note with people and multiple sclerosis is going to be something I'm uh, going to ask you about shortly. So uh, a lot of folks are going to watch that, watch this and go, well, you know, I'm, I'm keen to start supplementing vitamin D uh, and I pretty much guarantee that some of them are going to go and see their doctor and discuss it and they're going to run into uh, a brick wall. Um, tell us about, uh, and, and before we start talking about diseases uh, specifically, um, why this reluctance uh, when you go to see your family doctor to even have uh, a discussion about vitamin D? It's, it's really difficult. It's like the first barrier I came across back in 15. There are uh, many, many reasons why the doctors are reluctant to recommend vitamin D. Later on, I'll show you some of the ways you can ask your doctor to do it, but here is one example of uh, a case we made a video out of it, um, where the doctor got all of his 2000 patients up to 80 nanograms of vitamin D. And he ran into some problems with this and most doctors will run into the same problem. He found that the number of visits to his uh, group, uh, that's the reason had 2,000 people, had quite a few doctors involved, uh, it dropped from four visits per year down to one visit per year because the the person there with the cast, you still get a broken leg, you get a big injury, but the other people that weren't feeling good, they're gone. They are no longer coming to his place. So he actually had to stop his practice because he was no longer earning enough money. Now, most doctors aren't 
quite so aware that this is uh, the problem, but that's one of the problems that doctors have of recommending some, okay, doctors are focused on treating problems. They're not focused on preventing problems. That's for human doctors. Veterinary doctors, doctors of, uh, for animals, especially on farms, they're paid to keep their patients healthy. And so they prescribe on a per pound basis three times as much vitamin D as humans get. That's not the first time I've, I've heard, um, heard someone talk about uh, veterinary uh, supplementation. <laughs> is, that, is that correct? Yeah, uh, but I, I, that was one of my first information sources for vitamin D. So I have 160 categories of information on vitamin D. The very first one was veterinary because they appeared to be, and they still are about 10 years ahead of the human doctors because they are paid to keep their patients healthy. They're yeah, rewarded. Yeah. Yeah, how, how, um, I've got a question uh, about veterinary um, coming up for you, uh, Henry. But, um, you know, uh, I have to say across the literature, um, 18 nanograms per milliliter uh, keeps on popping up here, there and everywhere uh, as a um, physiologically significant kind of level to achieve. And um, I can tell you once I reach 80 nanograms per milliliter, my cluster headaches cease to be. It's, um, it's absolutely amazing. So uh, when I started, I um, was taking significant uh, amounts of vitamin D. Um, what is the go in terms of folks that are watching this that are, a keen start supplementing uh, is it enough to cruise down to the uh, pharmacy and pick up one of those bottles of 1000 international units and um, uh, and are they going to reach 80 nanograms per milliliter um, or what's your view about taking uh, higher amounts when you start supplementing vitamin d uh, in order to reach uh, that level there that's the whole subject of being on a maintenance level of getting vitamin D versus having a loading dose. Uh, first of all, that, uh, oh, last week a friend gave us a call. They said that they had gotten COVID and what could they do? Uh, and I said, hey, just need to take uh, 200,000 IUs of vitamin D as soon as you can and it'll go away. Well, the only one, the only size she had was 5,000 IUs. So, so she went ahead and took uh, the 40 pills that she had, and she felt really great the next day and has been doing very fine since then. Mm. So it's a little bit of a problem if you are limited as to the size of pill that you have. It's, it's quite um, a, a difficulty to uh, try to swallow a lot of pills. So I recommend people have the, the vitamin D ahead of time for to be able to handle emergencies like that. But now going back onto the subject of loading dose and maintenance dose, uh, you can get to an 80 nanogram uh, level of vitamin D provided you have, I think it's about 7,000, well, between 5,000 and 7,000 I use of vitamin D on a daily basis, you'll get there in about three to four months. But if you wanna hurry it up a bit, the body, as I mentioned before, has really learned how to store quite nicely the vitamin D. When it becomes available, it says, I'll, I'll take this in, I'll store it away and can use it again late for a, on a rainy day. And so it turns out that you can get your levels up to 80 nanograms or 100 nanograms or for something like that, if you wish, uh, within a few days uh, instead of having to wait a few months. Mm -hmm. And so understandably for a person that is uh, potentially taking a, a thousand international units per day, it's a big jump. Uh, and understandably that person about like, hold on a minute, 600,000 international, 200,000 international. That's like taking 200 of these pills. Surely that cannot be good for you. Cannot be safe. Uh, what are you going to well, say? Let's look at it in terms of, uh, the 200,000 I use of vitamin D that I recommend for people that having a loading dose, that's the same as if you were on a sunny beat, 
trying to get a suntan on a beach for 10 days in a row, that's about how much vitamin D you get. So it's not that awful ex ex uh, excessive. The body is used to be able to absorb that. Mm, mm. No, and, you don't want to start that off for your skin, as I mentioned earlier, all at once of, you know, I've not been out in the sun at all. And I'm going to be out there now for three or four hours every noontime. Nope, that's, that doesn't work out. You have to kind of gradual up, get it, get it more gradually. Yeah. Okay. As a parallel, um, in terms of a loading dose uh, for the treatment of cluster headache and migraine, uh, Pete Batchelor's regimen calls for uh, 600,000 international units over 12 days. So uh, 50K a day and then reduce uh, to 10,000 international units per day in order to maintain uh, your level uh, around 80 um, uh, and uh, and it's worked for uh, many people. Now, um, I want to talk uh, about raising your levels because uh, I've noticed some folks elevate very quickly. And, and as I just said, if I take 600,000 international units, I'm pretty much guaranteed that my level will be uh, somewhere between uh, 80 and 100 nanograms per milliliter. And I want to tell you the story of a friend of mine who also took 600,000 international units in November last year. Uh, and he um, checked his level. It was 21 nanograms per milliliter. He was like, what's going on? At any rate, uh, I caught up with him last week and he had decided to take 30,000 international units every day since uh, for a total amount of, get this, uh, 1,560,000 uh, thousand international units uh, uh, and he rechecked his level it had risen to 52 nanograms uh, per milliliter talk to me about this i can't hear you oh you want me to respond to that yeah i i okay. mean I some yes. people seem to in increase um, uh, quickly. Some yes. people t take like significant amounts of vitamin D and their levels uh, gradually increase. What's all that got to do with? There, there's two things to be discussed in there. One is that there's a huge variability, about a four to one variability in how much vitamin D you need to get to a certain level. So this little not normal, uh, Histogram here shows that for some people who are obese and taking 50,000 IUs of vitamin D weekly, weekly as to how much variation they had on how much they gained. Uh, many of them gained sort of like 10 nanograms, but all the ones in the pink section, uh, they actually dropped in their vitamin D levels. Uh, but but in this other region, you can see that there's a, a fair amount of range. It's generally acknowledged to be about four to one for uh, one person who gets 50,000 IUs of vitamin D a week uh, will get to a certain level, but some people will get four times as much as that. Uh, it, it, it varies tremendously between individuals. Uh, fortunately, getting a, a very high level of vitamin D is not a problem. So it's quite good to recommend to people that they take a certain amount of vitamin D for say three months and then get a vitamin D test to confirm that you're in the region that you thought you, you, were, you were expecting to get to. Uh, a few people will have to uh, uh, increase it even more than, than they were taking because they found that, whoops, I didn't get as much as I was expecting to. Uh, many people say, ah, oh, I got a, I got to the level I wanted to get to, say 80 nanograms or 50 nanograms or whatever your goal is. And then you can drop back down to a smaller dosage on a, uh, on a frequent basis, so be, say once a week. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so sticking with my friend's situation, right, I imagine uh, a lot of people um, who would take kind of 600,000 as a loading dose and then find that their level was still... Uh, quite low would go, oh, something's wrong here. I've got to stop taking it um, and not persevere through. So uh, what you're saying uh, is that um, uh, people that are, are, are larger than, you know, large, uh, obese, um, require more. Uh, and so that could be a reason why uh, his level didn't um, didn't increase uh, as fast as perhaps what, as what so mine So during the last 10 years, I've been documenting the reasons why people have a poor 
generally looking at poor response, slow response is another thing again, but poor response uh, to the vitamin D levels. These are the ones which are, uh, I've, were, were the prominent ones out of the 40. You can click on the bottom link there to get all the details, but being obese, being elderly or having a poor gut, you generally need about two times more vitamin D or a gut friendly form. Uh, if you have a various health problems like autism, anemia, diabetes, some cancers and about 15 others, uh, you need about double the amount of vitamin D. And then uh, there's uh, magnesium. Uh, you don't have enough magnesium or you're smoking, they need a little bit more. Yeah, and um, we'll talk about cofactors, but um, that's not the first time I've seen um, take your vitamin D with your largest meal. Can you uh, can, yeah, enlighten me as to why that is? Um, there's probably been 30 studies on that, but it, intellectually it works out to be pretty easy to understand is that when you take the vitamin D orally, it gets into your gut and into your intestine. And it's the small intestine that does the absorbing of whatever, whatever nutrient you have. And if you think about, and then next meal comes along, uh, whoops, all the stuff goes out of small intestine into the large intestine. And so you're no longer able to access what is there. So if, for instance, you take the vitamin D at breakfast, and then it gets to be in your small intestine for four hours, and okay, it's, I'm coming along, I'm getting the vitamin D out of here, but then, whoops, it's getting pushed out, but here comes lunch. Uh, but um, for most people though, the largest meal of the day is supper. So I'll use that as the example. There, you, the vitamin D gets into your small intestine after supper and kind of the intestine gets a 12 hours to work on getting the stuff out of there, uh, you know, getting all the nutrients out of there. So the, the largest meal of the day, or the actually the, the meal in which it's the longest time until you have another meal, mm, which is generally mm. considered to be supper for most people, uh, is the best time to take vitamin D, either before the, the, the meal or during the meal or after the meal, it's somewhere in that time period. Mm. Um, you know, you've said before to me, Henry, that uh, you cannot just restore the levels uh, to an optimum level. Uh, they must be maintained. Now, uh, I know yes. for myself, uh, I take 10,000 international units in order to be able to keep my level uh, at around 80. T talk to me about yourself. Like, uh, what do you need to take um, in order to stick in uh, the range? And what is that range that you aim to kind of stick around? Uh, <laughs> As I have been progressing along over the last uh, 12 years now, uh, the vitamin D level that I was trying to achieve, I did. And then I was reading about it that, hey, more is better than I tried that. And more is better, I've tried that. And so I'm currently at 200 nanogram level of vitamin D. And that seems enough um, and feels very, very good. Uh, anything over about 40 nanograms of vitamin D, though, you need to balance out with the other cofactors, some of which I've got shown on this screen of uh, omega-3 and magnesium are particularly important ones. Vitamin K2, iodine, boron uh, are some of the, among the, the lesser ones that need to be balanced out. I'm, I'm still, um, sorry, Henry, I, I, I think I'm still, in sh I'm still in shock. So 200 nanograms per milliliter. And just for any Kiwis that are watching, that's um, uh, 200 times 2.5, that's, that's uh, 500 nanomoles. Yes. Um, per liter so it's uh, you know it's a it's a high level what do you need to take in terms of a daily uh, or weekly dose to keep your level in that range out of curiosity uh taking vitamin d on an irregular basis not on a daily basis is the best uh, got 16 studies showing that uh, so i actually take a hundred thousand i use of vitamin d once every four days but mm -hmm. I would not recommend people to do that just by itself. You have to, at th that level of taking vitamin D, add in magnesium as an example. Occasionally I get forgetful and not take the magnesium. I run into some difficulties. 
uh, but omega-3 and uh, vitamin K2 are also very essential on a long-term basis. You know, uh, or long-term is you wouldn't notice the problem of having enough vitamin K or enough omega for probably two, three, four years. Uh, but they starts to have problems like hardening of the arteries, for instance, if you don't have the vitamin K2 in there, if you're above about 40 nanograms. Uh, but before we start uh, asking you questions about cofactors, because it's a, again, it's a, it's another piece uh, for people to understand. I, I want to ask you a question in and around, uh, you know, what is the consequence uh, of keeping your level uh, at a level uh, that is the same all year round? That is suffice to say, uh, isn't your vitamin D level kind of supposed to change uh, with the seasons? So is there a consideration around, you know, being 80 nanograms uh, in the middle of the winter? Um, wouldn't my body internally be thinking, oh, it's summertime? Uh, when an actual fact outside it's winter? That was what I, I had asked myself uh, uh, 10 questions about vitamin D when I started before starting vitamin D wiki. That was one of the questions is should the vitamin D levels go up and down with season? Haven't really got that one answered, but the best I can understand is probably the, there wasn't a concept of season back when humans were starting off in Africa or other places near the, uh, near the tropics. Um, and then when you had no seasonality, the body went on for a hundred thousand years or longer of not actually having seasons to have to deal with. So maybe when you're living in a climate uh, further away from the, from the sun and, and the, and you've been living, uh, your ancestors have been living there for thousands or tens of thousands of years. Maybe you should go up and down with the season, but I haven't really gotten that one understood. Mm. I've kind of come to the conclusion, good level all the time. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I'm pleased to know that I'm not the only one kind of uh, rolling that particular question around in my head. Uh, so uh, yep. really interested in your comments. Uh, if you're watching this, uh, what do you know? Uh, link us paper uh, and share your thoughts. Um, now, cofactors, uh, Henry. Uh, I always, I think the, the first two that people talk to me about, uh, uh, you must take your K when you take your D. Um, some folks say uh, you need to include both fish oil uh, and magnesium. And I know uh, the cluster uh, headache regimen uh, calls for the inclusion of both um, boron and zinc. Uh, talk to me about cofactors. What are they uh, and what are they doing to support vitamin D? Um, let's take magnesium for a moment. Uh, magnesium is involved in the processing of vitamin D at eight different locations in the body. You know, I was mentioning in the liver and the kidney that uh, it, it adds in the, uh, the water molecule to semi-activate or fully activate the vitamin D. Well, magnesium is a catalyst that's involved in doing that. And if the magnesium isn't there, it doesn't get processed as well. So overall, it works out that uh, if you have a low level of magnesium, you need 30% more uh, vitamin D to get to the same level. So it that by itself is just saying, you know, if I, if I just looked at that by itself, I'd say, oh, I'll just take more vitamin D. It's cheaper and easier to take than the magnesium. But it turns out there's a lot of other things that uh, goes beyond that uh, in terms of the importance of these other cofactors. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, vitamin K, by the way, is uh, an interesting item that I think I've got about 70 studies on vitamin vitamin K and vitamin D. Uh, yes, uh, I agree that vitamin K is needed along with the vitamin D. Uh, there's some disagreement about it's being needed at the same time, because it turns out the vitamin K and vitamin D uh, access the same sort of receptors in, the, in various places in the body. And so the vitamin K can actually, if done at the same time, will block the vitamin D somewhat. So it's best to have it on an off day. It, it appears to, that this data is not in on, finished up on that particular subject. Mm -hmm. uh, and omega-3 uh, for soil, what's the deal? It, 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 
Um, omega-3 is both a cofactor for vitamin D, that is to say, uh, it helps with the uh, helps with the use of vitamin D uh, in the body, but it is also by itself a very good, healthful thing to have. Um, the uh, omega-3 stops uh, one of its major claims to fame, and I got 150 different studies on this, is that it uh, greatly reduces inflammation of all kinds in the body. Vitamin D decreases inflammation, and they work synergi synergistically together very, very nicely on oh, probably 40 health problems that I've got documented. Mm -hmm. And the other um, smaller ones up on your graphic, uh, Henry, yeah. uh, zinc, boron, and I uh, is the I for iodine, is it? Yes, it is. Uh, and so can folks get what they need out of like, a, like I take a, a men's multi, is that, you know, is that what we're talking about? Uh, for most people, the, the boron and the zinc and the iodine are not essential. Uh, they are not essential cofactors at all. In fact, when I recommend to people taking vitamin D, I say, hey, let's just go with vitamin D by itself. You're good to go for six months, at, even if you're taking a fair amount of vitamin D. And then you can start to get around to thinking about, let's improve the health even more with magnesium and omega-3 and other things. And I actually rarely get around to recommending people take the boron and zinc. Some uh, people are, uh, anyway, <laughs> mm -hmm. there are other things to do with your health. As this chart was showing, uh, the exercise and healthy foods are more important than all the other things you're talking about. Yeah, rank that number one and, uh, and number two. Now, now, uh, St Dr. Stasha Gomenak uh, includes uh, and talks at length about a B50 uh, or 100 uh, complex. Now, uh, that doesn't appear uh, in the circles up on the screen. Just talk to me about your thoughts around vitamin uh, B as a, as a complex to take alongside D. There are quite a few, uh, I'm not sure where, where that section is right now. Um, oh, well. Uh, there are quite a few groups that when they are experimenting along and seeing uh, and not being constrained by randomized controlled trials and they give people a lot of vitamin D, then, oh, they don't, that didn't do everything. And then they start to stumble across and say, oh, some of these B vitamins uh, seem to be essential. Uh, there's some disagreement between the cluster headache people and the sleep people with... Uh, uh, Dr. Gomernock and uh, Dr. Coimbra with multiple sclerosis as to how much and what kind of B vitamins are needed. Uh, it's, so I don't really have a consensus there. It turns out that uh, between all the B vitamins and oh, is B12 the one that's really needed? It, that may be the case. I've got uh, about 30, paid, 30 different studies on B12 but sometimes B3 looks important, but uh, just as a general sort of way, they, uh, many manufacturers have come up with a B50 and a B100. That's what they are is actually a combination of the B vitamins to the tune of about 50 uh, milligrams each or hundred milligrams each. And you just take that and you say, okay, I, I don't know exactly how much I want of each of these, I'll just take that. And right. that seems to work out pretty well for most people. It's when you get up to the very high levels with the cluster headaches, um, multiple sclerosis, et cetera, that maybe getting a particular B vitamin is necessary. But since I've lacked a, I haven't gotten a consistency among the different groups as to what B vitamins are needed. Uh, I, I don't have a conclusion as to what specific ones are needed. Uh, and I think uh, it is an area where the literature uh, uh, continues to evolve. It's certainly a fascinating aspect of vitamin D to follow. Uh, and yes. uh, yeah, I, I think it was uh, Dr. Gomnak that talks uh, in particular about uh, B5 or pantothenic acid uh, being uh, uh, somewhat involved uh, intricately in the sleep process. Now, 
Um, vitamin D itself um, in ring number three uh, in your graphic. Now, someone told me a couple of weeks ago it comes from uh, uh, lamb's wool grease when you buy it uh, at the pharmacy. Uh, you know, I'd be really keen to hear uh, your thoughts about how uh, and where vitamin D uh, comes from. The same person that was talking to me said that uh, if you uh, took one lamb's fleece, uh, it contains enough lanolin uh, to produce 1 million doses uh, of vitamin D3 for human consumption. That's just absolutely outrageous. And I imagine it uh, wouldn't cost a lot uh, to produce. Talk to me about how vitamin D is made in the supplement. Uh, but vitamin D is, can be made from various animal sources. Um, the, the most popular one by far is getting it from sheep lanolin. Uh, don't have to kill any sheep involved in this, just... Uh, do their, their <laughs> shave the sheep and you get the vitamin D. It, you have to go through a fair number of processes to do it. Um, but it, it, you get that. And then actually what's involved is it's somewhat like um, the, the lanolin right there isn't the vitamin D, but they, they after treating it and getting out the essence of the chemical uh, off of the sheep, then they apply the UV just as you apply the UV and the skin, and then that creates the vitamin D. How um, so it, it's got some commonality with the way we do it. It turns out that cats and dogs uh, get the vitamin D the same way. And that's one of the reasons that cats like to lick themselves. They get the vitamin D from the fur. Likewise, you can see lots of birds uh, that are preening, preening themselves. And it turns out that they are getting the vitamin D from uh, from their feathers, uh, they wouldn't get it otherwise. Yeah, I don't have any cats, Henry, but I've got two dogs. So I've got a long-haired uh, border collie, and uh, I've noticed uh, over the past couple of weeks that summer down here, uh, he he loves to sit out uh, in the sun. I'm thinking, mate, you must be just roasting, um, but he's making his vitamin D, is he not? Uh, I uh, a few years ago, I did an experiment with a person's cat and had the cat and had two different uh, places for the cat to sit. One place had a sun lamp and the other place with the same amount of warmth had a UV lamp. And it preferred sitting under the UV lamp. Unreal. So yeah. it was uh, becoming aware of that. There's uh, other examples, uh, another person in New Zealand actually uh, had a dog that was getting on in, in years and Gave it, gave it vitamin D and became almost like a puppy in terms of being all energetic again. So, uh, uh, is is that the 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 seventeen year old Labrador named Bo? I think you can read yes, about it on your. Yep. Yep. Uh, we'll make sure we include that link uh, because it's a really cool story to read uh, and it just just gives you another avenue and angle uh, to appreciate the subject. Um, so Henry, different forms of vitamin D, uh, you know, D3, uh, D2 from foods, from the sun, uh, what's best? And uh, I preface again this question by saying, if you go to a supermarket in New Zealand uh, and go to buy a packet of mushrooms, uh, they have a prominent label on them promoting the uh, vitamin D. There you go. There's the image up yeah. on the screen. Uh, talk to me about this. Is vitamin D2 uh, that you'll find in mushrooms, what is that? Uh, why is it different to vitamin D3? And uh, should I be eating more mushrooms? Uh, vitamin D2 for a fair number of years when I was starting off was looking like it would be, should be as good as vitamin D3, but there have been now well over 50 studies that vitamin D2 is not nearly as good as vitamin D3 for the body and isn't absorbed as well and uh, doesn't provide the, the same kind of benefits. There are a couple of studies that even indicated that it, taking more vitamin D2 decreases your vitamin D3 levels. So uh, although there are quite a few people that are going for the uh, mushroom form of vitamin D2, uh, it's most likely not the right one to go for. Uh, even the uh, the biggest researcher in the world on vitamin D, Dr. Hollick, he was greatly sponsoring vitamin D2 for a fair number of years as I was starting off on vitamin D wiki, but he's completely gone away from that now. 
Right. Uh, and, and so uh, I know if you go and see a doc in New Zealand, um, the chances are you will end up uh, with coli calciferol, uh, vitamin D3. Uh, yes. But in other countries, uh, doctors may look to prescribe uh, vitamin D. And when that script is filled uh, at a pharmacy, they may give you D2. Now, um, talk to me about that. Should um, should folks just be saying, hey, uh, you know, uh, I'd prefer vitamin D3, please, or is it no biggie? Or what, what are your views? Uh, it, it's a large biggie, actually. Uh, w- one of the other aspects of vitamin D2 is it stays in the body for a much shorter period of time. And so you, for vitamin D2, you have to take it on a daily or at worst every three day basis versus vitamin D3 can be taken uh, every two weeks or every month. It's stored in the body far better. Uh, body's not used to dealing with vitamin D2. It's far more practiced up, if you will, with dealing with vitamin D3. Mm-hmm. And so sticking with um, sticking with the topic of the different forms of vitamin D, when we look at uh, vitamin D3, uh, there's the option of folks going for these liquid emulsions in the, in the dropper bottles uh, or the gel capsules. Uh, what's the benefit uh, of going with either or um, would be a, you know, a question that I ask. Is there any difference there, at all? There's there's some amount of difference between it, but not not uh, not nearly as large as the difference between uh, vitamin D three and vitamin D two. There's some difference, and it depends on the person. Sometimes the uh, the gel cap will contain a kind of oil that makes it such that the vitamin D is not absorbed by oh thirty percent of the population. It's it gets less than a 20% reduction in the absorption. Uh, in some cases, uh, for infants, there, were, there used to be a kind of, still is, uh, a kind of uh, vitamin D uh, drop that they would be given that they'd spit back out because they found it just to be incorrect for them. And they later on, the research found out why. And so that kind, kind is generally not given anymore. Mm. Go back on your comment about the vitamin D2 being prescribed. Uh, th- that again goes back uh, back to the 60s or so in which vitamin D2 was the form to be prescribed because maybe the reason being, unfortunately, is that the company's got a lot more money out of prescribing D2 than D3. And so at the whole doggone chain got going there. Uh, there was a fair amount of effort through a friend of mine, actually, uh, who got around to talking to the various drug distribution companies in the United States and making D3 available for the doctors to prescribe. And so now that's pretty much all of the doctors now in the United States prescribe D3, but probably in 40 or 50 countries right now, around the world, if the doctor prescribes vitamin D to you, it will be of, of, of the vitamin D2 persuasion because that person didn't get around to telling all the rest of the world. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and, and look, while we're still on the subject, um, talk to me about uh, topical D3. You mentioned it uh, earlier and uh, I it just piqued my interest. I know my uh, sister's husband deals with... Uh, uh, psoriasis uh, he gets it quite bad um, uh, would um, so what is what is topical vitamin D never heard of it before it, topical vitamin D comes in various forms it's uh, as a liquid uh, some have have a spray and some of them is a cream uh, for myself I used to have psoriasis on my right knee from a bicycle injury <laughs> and it looked kind of yuck Uh, But I found for myself and many other people do, if you apply the vitamin D to a portion of your skin where you want the skin to be improved, whether it be a psoriasis or burn or wart or various other odds and ends, applying it topically, it goes into the body right there. And it appears as though you end up just below the skin with about a 
hundred times more concentration of vitamin D getting there than if you had taken it orally through your mouth and then it finally gets around down to your knee. If you put it directly onto the spot that you, that you want to deal with, it works far, far better. Right. Um, now, the next question is, uh, is, a, is a somewhat complicated one, and I still find myself kind of struggling to understand. I wanted to ask you, uh, people talk about um, genetic polymorphisms, uh, and it's a big, long word, and it sounds super complex, uh, and in and around the genes related to um, a vitamin D metabolism, converting vitamin D from the supplement form into the storage form, uh, into the active form now. Uh, is yep. that something that folks should be worried about um, uh, before they start taking vitamin D? And what are they? Uh, actually, some of those genes were mentioned back up here in this other screen. <laughs> ah, yes. So the ellipses have the various genes which can increase or decrease the amount of vitamin D that gets into your body. Uh, in general, they are not really large amounts, but like for instance, in that uh, uh, the upper two genes there, if you have a poor uh, CYP2R1 or CYP27A1, if those aren't working too well, the amount of vitamin D that you take in through your mouth doesn't get down to your liver. And so that's one of the reasons that, that I was mentioning the uh, lack of sunshine being one of the reasons for having lower vitamin D, but having a poor gene up there ends up that your, your blood test isn't as high. And, uh, you know, and, and, and the, the best solution for that is to take more vitamin D. Right. Now, unfortunately, you'll notice most of the ellipses are below the vitamin, the, the blood test level so that, you can get up to and have, oh, say a 50 nanogram level of vitamin D, but if you had a poor vitamin D binding protein or a vitamin D receptor gene poor problem or some of these others that don't have names, they're just, uh, just acronyms, you can end up with uh, having not as much vitamin D getting to your, uh, to the, to your cells of your body. Uh, and, and that's invisible from the vitamin D test. So uh, should people be testing? Well, I mean, can you test uh, for these um, for these gene issues? And uh, in your experience, uh, being in the world of vitamin D for a while, uh, how many people might uh, have uh, an issue with their genes related to D metabolism? Uh, approximately thirty percent of all people have a problem with the vitamin D receptor. That that's where it gets actually into the mitochondria inside of the genes, but it is very it is somewhat difficult to notice uh, or expensive to notice if you have those gene problems, but it doesn't really matter. You, if you just look at how do I feel and is, am I breathing better? Am I having less pain? And, and other, just getting an, a feeling of, for things will summarize all of these uh, and, and make it so they're not too consequential. There, are, there is a specific vitamin D receptor test that you can get that costs $30. I tested and found out that, oh, rats, I have a poor vitamin D receptor. So independent of the cofactors, there are some things which increase the vitamin D receptor, the activation of that gene. And the, uh, there are 14 of them that I've got listed currently on the webpage uh, that is increasing at about one every six months um, recently. And I'm currently take I'm doing nine of them, uh, so I'm kind of covering the bases, or I, I like to think of as a shotgun. Of I don't know which of these is going to particularly help. I'll do all of them. Right, uh, folks would be interested um, maybe to explore where they can get uh, that test done. Is there a link for more information on uh, genetic vitamin D related testing? Uh, right. Or, if you if you click on this link here. Um, for more information, uh, that gets you to the part on genes, and there's a large section there on the vitamin D receptor, and that has the information on the vitamin D receptor test, uh, which, which you can also, by the way, get. There's a, a gene company, 23andMe, that uh, tests genes, and it, and 
it in there gets the uh, vitamin D receptor gene. It doesn't say what its current activation is. It says what you what it should be activated as as part of the genes that you got at the time of birth. Right. Uh, I, I know folks will recognize 23andMe. I know uh, Dr. Rhonda Petrick uh, has talked about that uh, yes. um, a couple of times before. So uh, there you go. And the link the link will be there. Now, um, I'm surprised uh, the uh, people that I talk to, the amount of people that have had uh, issues uh, with their parathyroid uh, glands and, um, and uh, in some cases uh, uh, on um, thyroid hormone, uh, daily now, uh, those folks uh, can they still take vitamin D? Is there any considerations for uh, someone that has issues with their parathyroid before uh, supplementing? I I've been down that path a, a little bit. I've got maybe thirty studies on the parathyroid and thyroid uh, uh, operation, and it seems that that's not one of the problems. That's not a concern about your taking vitamin D. There are a couple of concerns of not taking vitamin D. The primary one that I, I'm quite aware of is with chemotherapy because the vitamin D uh, enhances uh, oh, about a half of the chemotherapy drugs, enhances them so much that the people can die off because of it. If the, if the doctor doesn't watch the white blood cell level and it keeps on giving the certain level of chemotherapy. If the person has has a high level of vitamin D, that chemotherapy drug is two to three times more potent than it would be if not. And so, for most drugs, it's nice to be have it more potent. Chemotherapy, it's not nice to be more potent. Right. Okay. That's um, uh, that's some good information. Uh, in terms of uh, barriers uh, you uh, find in folks starting a supplement like vitamin D now, uh, in 2015, if you'd asked me about it, I, I would have told you just a waste of money, mate. It'll turn into expensive pee. Uh, I make everything I need uh, through eating well and exercising. Um, so uh, what are some, kind of some of the common barriers that you uh, find uh, in people? Yeah, I've got... There, there's quite a few barriers that the people have and that doctors have. They're down here a little ways. Okay, here are 18 problems that people have barriers for starting vitamin D supplementation. Uh, turns out that all of them are really non-barriers, but you have to think through them and how to deal with them. Uh, but like, for instance, some people think you have to get a vitamin D test. Uh, no, you don't. Uh, you can, it's actually best to not, uh, you don't need a vitamin D test before starting off. It's nice to see what your body's reaction is to the vitamin D level you have and get a test in a few months. But so some people due to the fear of the needles or a hassle of getting the test or the cost will say, I'm not going to go to the vitamin D at all because uh, I'm, a, I'm afraid of the test. Uh, some people are fair, afraid of the toxicity. Uh, anyway, there's 18 of the things there. And I've described in detail each one of the 18 bears if on uh, that link that right there, this okay. is a summary of several pages of information. Look, so, just, just glancing over that list, sure. those are those I hear them all the uh, all the time. Uh, uh, particularly that one that says um, uh, you don't need it, uh, you make everything that you need. Uh, which is which to, yeah turns out to be not so true at all and um, so it's really cool that there uh, someone watching this is able to go through a uh, click in uh, and then understanding why that's uh, not quite the case my next question i guess and in, in topic uh, relates to one of those and that's uh, the concern uh, around toxicity now uh, again, I preface this question and topic by saying there are some pretty severe side effects listed on the New Zealand government's health health websites uh, in and around uh, vitamin D. I, I'll just read a couple out. Um, uh, adverse effects such as headaches, stomach upset, kidney stones, kidney failure, uh, abnormal heart rhythms. Uh, you should only take vitamin D as recommended and prescribed uh, by your doctor, health navigator. There's the link. What do you say to that? Uh, junk, uh, <laughs> that I'll look at the opposite of 
some of the reasons people are uh, not wanting to try the vitamin D because they're not sure whether it's going to be helping them or not. And so I've had very good success at having the people take a loading dose of vitamin D and having them personally feel how much better they feel in a week or two. They don't have to have cluster headaches and feel better. They, they feel better for them. Hey, sometimes it takes a little while and they'll say, doggone, I've got a higher level of vitamin D now. I haven't had any colds or flus during the season. Uh, other, or I'm just feeling happier during the day or uh, more alert during the day or other odds and ends. And I find that getting people past that barrier of trying out a new supplement. And does this help or not? Myself, I've tried out, as I said, hundreds of supplements. And I tend to give up on a supplement if I don't feel for myself that there's some benefit in a couple of months. Uh, some, some, I know that some of them won't benefit me until decades later, but that tends to be the case for many people that after they don't feel a benefit, they give up in a few months. And so toxicity then, uh, Henry, uh, I know that uh, some folks will even say, well, why would you take vitamin D? Uh, they give it to bloody uh, possums and rats to poison the things. Now, uh, yep. how many people have, uh, how many people have um, hit the hay and, uh, and passed away from uh, vitamin D overdoses? Is, is it something, uh -oh. you know, Tell uh -oh. me, is but start, start that perspective in terms of in the United States, 500 people die from uh, aspirin overdose every year. Now, starting with that perspective of in terms of overdose, there have been zero overdoses to the point of death due to vitamin D, zero in the last 10 years in the entire globe. So it is a rare, rare thing. Uh, and so if that was a barrier for someone, I'm scared to take a uh, higher dose uh, toxicity is probably not something uh, that that uh, you should be concerned about. Uh, quickly, talk to me about why are they knocking out um, possums and rats and mice with uh, vitamin D, coli, custard? Well, what's the deal there? Uh, well, it would knock you out too if you took equivalent of about 10 million IUs each meal. That's what the rats and the possums are getting. And it would, that would be very hard on you. You're, you're somewhat larger than a possum or a rat, <laughs> but it would be very hard on you. And yes, 10 million I use of vitamin D on a maybe several times a day basis or even a daily basis is a, a big problem. Uh, yeah. And if you look at that in terms of uh, I use per kilogram of body weight, it, it, that's how it works out. That yes, it, at really high doses, it does cause problems. But that, that's, uh, by the way, that was one of the things I looked at many years ago, looking at 50,000 I use of vitamin D in a bottle. It turns out that you can consume that entire bottle in a single day and not have a problem. You'll feel a little off and you, but not enough that you have to go to the hospital or anything. But if you took 10 of those bottles every day, that would cause a problem. Mm, mm. So I want to talk to you about disease burden, uh, in particular uh, with a lens uh, to the things that affect my fellow uh, New Zealanders. Now, I've uh, said a couple of times throughout this interview that uh, cluster headaches, uh, my cluster headaches were resolved uh, with vitamin D. I do not get them uh, anymore. Uh, uh, Henry, tell me what other diseases respond to vitamin so, D. So here are, just taken from the left-hand column of vitamin D wiki, here are the top health problems in terms of the number of studies for each of those, uh, starting with autism in the upper left-hand corner at 138 studies, bone health, 285 and going on down to trauma and surgery at 300. So that's the, give you a little feeling of to how well that has been studied. Uh, pregnancy, uh, turns out vitamin D is very useful of before, during, and after pregnancy. Uh, yeah. 700, 793 I, studies. 
Uh, I have been told uh, women really need to watch out if they're taking vitamin D. Make darn sure that you're taking birth control that uh, that increases fertility in both males and females. You talk to me about that. That's that's, that's really interesting. Yeah, the um, zoos learned uh, quite a few decades ago that they become a birthing factory if they give vitamin D to their animals. Uh, that it greatly increases the fertility. In the, one of the studies I was noticing that if you increase the vitamin D level to 50 nanograms for both the mother and the father, it increases the, ferti the net fertility, the factor of four. Also, it, also, we end up with much healthier children as, as a result. Um, before we talk more about uh, pregnancy, uh, uh, one of the things that caught my eye on that list, uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, I know okay. a couple of friends um, that, are, that are going down this journey right now. Now, um, talk to me about, uh, you know, I've said again, uh, really worked very, very well for cluster headache. Uh, are we talking about some efficacy and help here? Are we talking about um, remission in some case? You know, how far does this thing go? The, from the multiple sclerosis is one of the poster childs for vitamin D in as much as by having a high dose of vitamin D and uh, through a particular protocol called the Coimber protocol that's now being done by over 20,000 people around the world, they find that their, their multiple sclerosis essentially is completely goes away. That is to say, uh, many, many, many uh, testimonials I've got on my website, uh, but a, an example one is the person had been a runner and then got multiple sclerosis and was in a wheelchair and barely able to move around got the high dose vitamin D and she's off by being a runner running 10 miles a day. Uh, there are, that's, that's a, there are hundreds of testimonies like that. There's also many on the website of people looking at the brain scans of the people with multiple sclerosis and showing the white areas in which the brain isn't working anymore. And then they give them the high dose of vitamin D and the all the white areas go away and they're thinking again and operating, walking, running, jogging just fine afterwards. It, mm. I, I, it has caused me to wonder about how many other of the diseases on this page would get really cured by a high amount of vitamin D. Uh, yeah, and so let me ask you then, uh, correlative or causative? You know, I know a, a lot of academics uh, maybe watch this and go, uh, it's all very well to say, um, you know, list a whole lot of topics and, um, uh, and say that uh, vitamin D is at the root of it all. Now, uh, they're going to say correlative does not mean causation. Uh, right. And, uh, th that is a very important concern. Uh, that chart I had here, Ooh, doo -doo, doo -doo. Ah, nope. Ah, this one. All of these health problems that are listed here were found through randomized controlled trials of giving 50,000 IUs of vitamin D once every two weeks or a placebo to hundreds or thousands of people and finding the benefit in the vitamin D. That kind of eliminates the whole problem of is correlation versus causation, because the, the vitamin D caused that health problem to go down, to go to go away, uh, or decrease in various ways. You have to look at the details of each one of them. But mm. it's that level. I think I've got 750 randomized controlled trials uh, concerning vitamin D. I also have over 500 meta-analyses of which are summaries, uh, overviews of randomized control trials on vitamin D. And they're all virtually all showing that it really helps a lot. Uh, so sticking with um, pregnancy, uh, you, you made a comment uh, some time ago uh, when we were having a, a talk around uh, 6,500 international units kind of being uh, a, a good dose uh, for a woman uh, that's carrying a baby. Uh, is that because, you know, 
maybe sucking a bit of vitamin D out of mum and using that for, you know, just talk, I, I'm so, such a novice in that area. Talk to me about what, what you understand about reproduction and uh, vitamin D. Um, I consider reproduction being a little bit different than pregnancy. Let, let, let's concentrate on the pregnancy aspects of it. The, there are a whole bunch of trials that Dr. Hollis and, and Dr. Wagner uh, sponsored quite a few of them, ran quite a few of them, and they tried different levels of vitamin D, giving the, them to women, and found that they were having really good success on average across all the different women at 6,500 uh, international units of vitamin D daily for the pregnant woman. Uh, in terms of decreased um, health problems, uh, hypertension kind of things, preeclampsia, uh, decrease in uh, stillbirths, decrease in um, various other things during the pregnancy, uh, and then afterwards ending up with a much healthier infant. Uh, yeah, so uh, my wife was born, uh, 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 sorry, my stepson was born by uh, cesarean section. I uh, have read a couple of articles on your site that um, uh, that talk about that aspect as well. And uh, that the lower the vitamin D serum, uh, the increased risk of uh, having a cesarean section. Uh, so just why uh, there's specific uh, randomized control trials specifically on that, that the, the women who got the vitamin D ahead of time you know, or early on in the pregnancy were significantly, I've forgotten the factor, I think it's about a factor of two, less likely to need a cesarean section afterwards. Mm -hmm. It helps you know, broadly across a whole lot of health problems concerning pregnancy. And so really those questions uh, have been focused on mum. What's, um, what's vitamin D's role in, in kind of fetal development and, um, you know, the health of uh, your beautiful new baby? What's, um, what are the considerations there? What are your understandings and thoughts? I'll, I'll add a graphic in on the uh, transcript on this. There's excellent graphic showing the development of the infant from being a couple of cells to being to birth level and the the various parts of the body that are developed during that time and how vitamin D helps out during each of those different periods. Uh, so, uh, you know, you don't, for pregnancy, you just don't add vitamin D during the third trimester. You want to add it actually before uh, uh, conception is best, but as soon as possible of knowing about pregnancy, the adding the vitamin D is very, very important. And in a, um, in a world bent up on uh, being equal, please talk to me about um, the, my considerations as a, uh, as a bloke. Uh, what does vitamin D do, do to my um, reproductive system? My, my test, my test is Henry. Right. right. Um, well, it makes, your, makes for much healthier swimmers of the sperm. Uh, and they survive better and they, they work better there. But I can also uh, relate that uh, uh, makes sex a lot better too. It feels better. It's, uh, I think, better than, uh, I don't know, but better than Viagra or other things. Um, and now uh, this next question, uh, you, you look, you don't even have to answer it if you don't want to, but um, my mind wanders. I'm the kind of guy that thinks about uh, things off the beaten track and uh, sticking with reproduction and uh, whatnot, uh, your views on sexuality. Is there any correlation? Uh, I know, for example, Dr. Walter Stumpf uh, published at length regarding the brain uh, as a sex organ. Uh, what are your views? Uh, do you think this may be in a, a kind of an emerging field we learn more about uh, in the future, vitamin D uh, sexuality? Most likely. Uh, so far, all I can see is positive indications in terms of sexuality and vitamin D. I've ne seen nothing negative whatsoever. And so I'm leaning to saying, oh, that's probably a, a good thing. Uh, oh, you mentioned there concerning the vitamin D in the brain. Uh, it turns out that the brain blood barrier that one hears about, vitamin D 
has a little difficulty getting into the brain. So some Alzheimer's researchers said, Let, how can we get vitamin D into the brain? Uh, how, how, how to better get it? And so they found that, oh, there was a way of getting some chemicals into the brain. Uh, cocaine uh, users s sniff the cocaine and Don, there's a, it gets past the brain, blood brain barrier. There's a particular place through the nasal, through the nose nerves that the chemical go in. And so they did an experiment with mice of having them inhale vitamin D. And with the idea that what they were trying to do is how can we decrease the likelihood of getting Alzheimer's? And they found that, oh, inhaling vitamin D allows them, allows more vitamin D. They actually tested the vitamin D levels in the brain of the mice after inhaling that way, it gets more vitamin D. And so they were happy and they're more often doing other things. Uh, but that brings up that that study kind of tweaked my interest. And so I ended up making a vitamin D inhaler uh, and uh, have been using it myself now for the last four yeah. or five years. There's two, two, two aspects to that. And I want to park the inhaler and I want to park the, um, uh, that philosophical piece uh, in and around the brain as a sex organ and the brain and vitamin D, because I think it's very, very interesting and it can be seen from quite a spiritual uh, perspective. Uh, but I want to stick with disease burden uh, and in particular, uh, ob obesity and diabetes. Uh, you know, just over one in three Kiwis, uh, Henry, are overweight, you know, 34% of our population. And uh, I know many watching this wouldn't, wouldn't possibly mind uh, losing a little bit of weight. Uh, what are your views? Is there a specific level or threshold where uh, metabolism starts to get influenced by vitamin D? I know uh, Dr. Judson Summerville's book uh, talks about uh, uh, weight loss and vitamin D. What are your views? The more vitamin D you can have, the less your diabetes. That has been shown by over a hundred different randomized controlled trials. Uh, the obesity, there's some other complications of uh, the, the causes of obesity that, that would take another whole hour to describe in, in any kind of detail. But in terms of weight loss, that's been a little bit better described. Uh, and I've got, I think, a link on this page here, but I'll add it later if not, that the people who want to lose weight, they have to do something uh, in addition to taking vitamin D. Just taking vitamin D itself doesn't really do it, but if they add exercise or if they reduce calories, they will lose an extra uh, 10 to 15 pounds of weight during that time period in which they were doing the randomized control trial. And most interestingly, the, the, having the higher level of vitamin D allows them to keep the weight off because that's a, a frequent problem uh, that people have of uh, the yo-yo diet problem of, oh, I'll go on a diet and then I'll lose some weight. And then, okay, I'll go off the diet. Whoops, all the weight comes back and sometimes even more. But mm. if you do that same process, go on a diet and add vitamin D. And then when you go off the diet, you won't gain the back weight back, weight back nearly as much. Uh, and how does diabetes kind of um, fit into this uh, picture? Unfortunately, I don't have a mental model that I can describe as to how diabetes uh, is involved with vitamin D. Uh, there, I, uh, I can't remember what's on my webpage on, on diabetes right now. I, I don't have right. a good memory for all of those, but I do know that those people who were either in the category who were pre-diabetic and then they took, took half of them and gave them vitamin D and the other half not, the ones who were pre-diabetic, the ones that didn't Get the vitamin D went on to become diabetic. The ones that did almost entirely did not get go on to get diabetes. There's a so that's at one level of diabetes. The people who are, are diabetic and take vitamin D, it decreases many of the 
symptoms or the, the problems that people experience with diabetes. Uh, and again, there's a section uh, on your site. Uh, yeah, there's a section on the site there that's got uh, oh, 250 or 300 different studies on diabetes and vitamin D. Now, in terms of, you know, uh, sticking with um, gastrointestinal, exploring and fleshing that out, uh, yep. uh, I, I know so many people with IBS. It's like, it's just very, very common. Uh, colon cancer, second largest uh, leading cause of cancer death in New Zealand, above and beyond which uh, I haven't told you, but I, I'm an ex-chef of 15 years. And I, I can tell you that uh, when I started cooking, uh, I wasn't getting the level of orders that uh, I got towards the end of my career saying, uh, you know, staggering, uh, allergic to this, cannot have that. No, no, this, no, that, no, this, no, that, no. Yep, yep, uh, yep. What, why this increase and is it related uh, to vitamin D? Have you got literature that people can explore on this topic? I have many charts of showing the huge increase in IBS, in multiple sclerosis, uh, in cluster headaches, in sleep problems, in fertility problems, in psoriasis, all of which have gone up a fact. Uh, I've got a, several different pa pages of it has gone up a factor of two to, in some cases, a factor of 30 during the last 40 years. And every single one of them are related to uh, having a decrease in vitamin D level. The, uh, for instance, and doctors are slow at doing this, an example there on the colon cancer, there have now been 22, I believe it is, uh, meta-analyses, all of which have found that a higher level of vitamin D decreased the likelihood of the person getting colon cancer or decreased the problems of the colon cancer. Unfortunately, there's a huge industry involved in treating colon cancer, not preventing, treating. And there's been a great reluctance by those people who are, have studied and are experts being colon cancer experts they'll go out of business if they get if the people get vitamin D. Mm. Uh, people are starting to notice that this is helping out. Uh, for instance, on multiple sclerosis, uh, that particular one, I was just seeing a recent one that uh, some uh, blacks who are getting multiple sclerosis, they increased, the, they had a uh, it was a 16 times increase in the amount of vitamin D that they're getting. They elected to do themselves. Their doctors weren't saying it. They elected to do because they're starting to hear about it. I'm imagining there's sort of something similar to that in cluster headaches happening and sleep uh, and some of these other things. A hundred percent because, you know, yeah, it is unbelievable how this whole thing is patient led. Uh, we know it works. It's worked for, uh, over 3,000 uh, of us cluster heads now. Uh, and so it really is. Uh, and it's a really interesting aspect as this thing moves forward. Uh, it is being led by the people uh, uh, talking about it uh, amongst themselves and just uh, increasing increasing that awareness. Uh, and in and around, one of, the, one of the fascinating kind of topics uh, I've followed uh, and with great interest was uh, learning about Western Price. Now, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Western Price is uh, probably one of the earlier names in the early 1900s that, um, that uh, discovered the benefits of sunshine on oral health. Uh, fast forward today, you can search YouTube uh, and you will find, um, for example, uh, a dentist by the name of Joe Gold uh, talks at great length uh, about uh, uh, vitamin D and uh, oral health. Uh, what are your views uh, about oral health? And uh, look, uh, talk to me about fluoride. As I mentioned earlier, the American Dental Association was greatly promoting vitamin D in the 1930s. Unfortunately, the peop some people came along and pointed out to the dentist that, hey, if you apply fluoride topically to, the, to your patient's teeth, that will decrease the amount of cavities. And they, so then they flip-flopped in about a 10 year time period and then they're all pro fluoride. Unfortunately, since that turnover, um, 
the people that they started getting around to including uh, fluoride and toothpaste. And so people were getting the fluoride that way. And it turns out it's not nearly as beneficial for oral health as the vitamin D is. But that's uh, <laughs> various dentists around the world, and I'm in contact with some of them, are increasing the vitamin D level uh, in their patients. And uh, they're finding that hey, they're having fewer gum problems, they're having fewer broken teeth, they're having uh, fewer cavities, uh, on and on and on. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the dental implants even work better. Just when they're trying to insert a, 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 a false tooth as a sort of stake it in there, they find that applying a little layer of vitamin D to the tooth, the, the stake before they put it in there, makes it so it isn't rejected nearly as much. Uh, how interesting. And I recall in my interview with uh, Judson Somerville, uh, he mentioned uh, vitamin K as well uh, in and around periodontal yes. disease. Uh, uh, he said, watch out, the periodontists aren't going to want to uh, like me much. They're going to go to business as people uh, discover vitamin K is am amazing for uh, that condition. Uh, uh, speaking with uh, Dr. Somerville, in his interview I did with him, uh, uh, he mentioned to me that his practice went from one of the highest prescribers of uh, antidepressants in the tri-state area to uh, the lowest after introducing vitamin D into uh, their clinical practice. Now, uh, in NZ, I can tell you mental health is a massive, massive concern. Uh, I've got a report here, uh, Ministry of Health 2018, uh, mental health uh, uh, issues and problems on the rise, uh, particularly amongst young people. Now, uh, I know vitamin D is not the whole perspective on this very perplex uh, issue around mental health, but uh, please share your thoughts with me around uh, mental health and vitamin D. Well, as the chart I have right there, for instance, on depression, uh, at, it appears to go through many different studies. Well, th this is a, a, a how much vitamin D you need to deal with various problems. Rickets is at the lowest at 30 nanograms. If you bring the child who has rickets at the 30 nanogram level, the rickets goes away. Depression, it's about 40 nanograms, and then great decrease in depression. More is better, but that's, that's a good, good point to go with that. 50 nanograms, COVID-19, uh, fertility and psoriasis are some of the ones that deal quite nice, are fought quite nicely by 50 nanograms. Sleep seems need about 70. Cluster headaches needs about 80. Multiple sclerosis needs about 150. Mm. So, uh, Mm. And, and what do you think the mechanism is? Uh, uh, I'm really keen to get your perspective, and I'll, I'll just make some comments around uh, mental health uh, from the perspective of uh, some of the other researchers I've followed, and that is to say that um, vitamin D is very much a, a, a signaling molecule, and uh, and it is uh, uh, it is your physio your body's physiological. A way of knowing uh, what season it is outside. And so uh, Judson Somerville, for example, talks about uh, folks being in uh, a winter syndrome where uh, their vitamin D level is so low that they're uh, physiologically, their body believes that they are stuck in an endless winter. Uh, and so elevate them out of that, uh, that winter range uh, yep. kind of naturally to me, uh, you know, I feel really good in the summer you know, don't we all, we love going to the beach and, and we love, you know, that kind of, it just makes us feel good. And I just wondered what your views were from that aspect. I, I think that's a good uh, indication of the pop, how the body tells you that you're doing a good thing. It's kind of like the cat and the dog likes to get out or the, the cat particularly likes to get out in the sunshine or get some warmth and feels good. Likewise, humans Pretty much all humans on earth and most religions kind of revere the sunshine. Uh, they, and there, there's probably, if you think about it a little bit, there's probably some connection there between uh, improved health and, uh, and having sunshine. Uh, for, <clears throat> for a long time when I was growing up, uh, it was considered to be a good sexual thing that a person looks more sexually attractive if they had a good suntan. And 
there is kind of a relationship there that, hey, if you have a good suntan, that's an indication. There, you're generally looking healthier for other reasons than, than just the tan. You're looking brighter and happier and such. And more, uh, vi more vital. Yeah. Vi vitality uh, of life. Uh, talking about those that uh, have the vitality uh, of life amongst them, I uh, wanted to uh, let you know, I had someone uh, contact, contact me uh, recently who had uh, started taking high dose vitamin D and um, their commentary, commentary to me, uh, Henry, was that they had uh, very rapidly and very quickly increased their daily run uh, stretch from 15 kilometers to 30 kilometers. Um, and noted with an absolute ease, uh, they uh, said to me, Craig, I'm just absolutely amazed at the lack of muscle recovery uh, and soreness the next day. Uh, Henry, talk to me a little bit about sport and nutrition. There will uh, be people, yeah. Uh, will folks see benefits like this when they take vitamin D? I didn't mention it in here. It was running out of room of 50 nanograms, but many, many professional sports uh, teams and clubs around the world have come to see the benefits to the, their players in terms of uh, performing better, jumping better in basketball, uh, uh, running for a longer period of time without uh, soreness, uh, uh, having fewer injuries, recovering from the injuries more quickly, all of which comes uh, cross uh, basketball, uh, hockey, football, uh, soccer, uh, gymnastics, uh, taekwondo, uh, quite a few others uh, have all found that 50 nanograms helps tremendously for all of for, uh, for sports yeah. people. So I sent the particular gentleman to your website, to the wiki, uh, and he contacted me shortly afterwards to say that he'd found the papers that he was looking for uh, and, uh, and again, wanted to thank me for uh, introducing him to the vitamin D world. Now, uh, look, sticking with sports and nutrition, uh, shock horror, drop the mic. Uh, Henry, uh, talk to me about inhaled vitamin d what the absolute hang i've never heard of it before uh people are going to be tearing their hair out about this one please talk to me about this there's the inhaled vitamin d that going on i, I mentioned that study that the alzheimer's researchers did with the mice to get more vitamin d into the brain and then i i being a connoisseur of a interested in all things vitamin D, I said, what if you could, and so they had the mice inhale the vitamin D. I said, what if I could inhale the vitamin D? So I proceeded to just buy some stuff on Amazon, some nano emulsion vitamin D, added a little bit of water to it and bought some of these inhalers. I actually own 15 of them now. I've been loaning, lending them out to people and it works out very nicely. And uh, the one can inhale vitamin D and surprisingly, and I've not gotten an understanding why, but as it says at the top here, I find that inhaling only 500 IUs of vitamin D, a really small amount, greatly improves my breathing ability and my ability to exercise tremendously such that I rarely do any form of intense exercise without inhaling vitamin D uh, about five minutes before the intense level. Uh, so it, it, it's a, something simple that uh, you go to, the, to the, my website here for more details. It gives all the details about how, you know, the inhalers cost between, the, the mister cost between $9 and $25. The particular model that I seem to really like it costs $22. That's the one that's pictured. Uh, and it's a, a nice thing to do. There's no company selling it whatsoever, but I've been hoping that that would happen, but it hasn't. Well, the details are on the side. I'm sure that uh, there is going to be someone that uh, knows someone that talks about this thing that tries it and says, oh my goodness. Uh, and so this could be something that we hear uh, more about uh, in the near future. Uh, 
look, I've wanted to and have so far um, stayed well out of uh, the discussion on my uh, podcast uh, about vitamin D and uh, COVID-19. Now, it's come to the point, Henry, I, I can't ignore it uh, any longer. I've got my friends, my family, uh, visitors to my website asking me uh, about vitamin D and COVID-19. Uh, look, it's just become so politicized uh, that, uh, you know, you risk falling on one or the other side of the fence and offending people. My uh, interest yep. is purely scientific. Uh, I want to read. I want to know what the literature is saying. Uh, and I know uh, you're the kind of, you're a details guy. Um, talk to me about COVID-19 uh, and just give it to us. What is the literature saying? Um, where are we at? Yes. Okay, there's many, many studies that finds that uh, have found that COVID-19, uh, you have a less chance of getting it and you have less chance, you have a better chance of surviving it. If you take, there's a whole variety of different items. Uh, ivermectin is one, uh, vitamin D is another, uh, omega-3 is another, uh, resveratrol is another. There's quite a few different ones. Um, I happen to know a lot about the vitamin D part uh, with COVID-19, and it greatly decreases the chance of getting uh, COVID. And also, if you start to get COVID, if you take a very high dose of vitamin D, every person that I've recommended that to, the their COVID symptoms virtually vanish within three days. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is very good in terms of instantaneous sort of thing uh, or you know, be able to have, I call it emergency vitamin D for COVID. Uh, so in terms of following the literature uh, and seeing what has been posted on, you know, PubMed and, um, yep. uh, and various boards, is that information collated uh, on the vitamin D wiki so we can kind of uh, yes, see? Uh, uh, there, there's a whole section that has, I think there's 700 different studies now concerning COVID of which uh, on my vitamin D wiki site of which about 600 of them are vitamin D and the, the hundred other uh, are the, some of the other uh, ways of, of uh, preventing or fighting COVID. Right, and, and so specifically um, sticking with vitamin D, that's a lot of papers uh, for people to kind of, uh, I guess, be across. Is there any organization uh, that is looking at all of these papers and kind of running a, a, a current and up-to-date meta-analysis of... Um, There's of a, quite a few. Of, <clears throat> There's one particular one that does an excellent review of, I think it's 23 different things that seem to be useful uh, to prevent or fight COVID. And uh, uh, they nicely have uh, updated, they update their information and it's extremely in good detail. I don't try to duplicate it at all, but they nicely update the information in a graphic form. And I've got it on my website that their information is updated on my page every single day. And so if you go at it today, it will show today's date, whenever it is, as to what the latest information is on all of those different uh, ways mm. of uh, fighting COVID. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, COVID-19 uh, aside, uh, it always bemuses me, uh, Henry, I see uh, news articles, uh, and I'm going to put some headlines, typical headlines uh, from New Zealand news publications that uh, folks will see uh, every single uh, winter. Uh, look, let me read, health authorities brace for, uh, you know... Okay. You had shown me the headlines earlier. Um, yeah, there, yeah, there's some of the... So can you tell me uh, why is it uh, that uh, we, as humans, associate uh, winter with a, a more se severe or uh, greater outbreaks of respiratory kind of type viruses, colds, flus, uh, you name it. Why is that happening in winter? There are many different, uh, okay. Most people agree that there is something about winter that causes 
increased flus and colds. That, that, that's acknowledged. Now comes the disagreement as to what the reason is, or is there a single reason or are there multiple ones? Uh, everything I've seen so far is that vitamin D is a very significant reason for that increase in flus and colds, uh, the, the lack of vitamin D uh, that happens when you're not out in the sun as much. Uh, oh, by the way, one of the indications of that is that it's on the, in terms of, it's not, and so some people say it's uh, the temperature. Some people say it's the lack of sunshine. Some people say it's the humidity. An example in the Middle East, there they have such intense uh, sunshine that they stay out of the sun so much during the summer that that's when they get their flus and colds. So right. to me, that was a good example of, ah, uh, maybe it has to be the lack of the UV and the vitamin D that's causing the flus and colds, because for them, they run between the building and the car and hit their air conditioned car and then run, not just walk, run to, to get into their home because it's such intense sunshine. Right. Right. Um, you know, it's, yeah, it's almost staggering if there is a correlation or, or uh, indeed a causation in and around vitamin D serum level, how much vitamin D is in your tank uh, heading uh, into, uh, into winter. And if you uh, didn't increase or elevate uh, your level uh, when the sun was shining, uh, then uh, you're more at risk uh, of having uh, a, a bout of, co of cold uh, or flu over the winter season. Or, or another example comes from multiple sclerosis. The army has been, the you know, U.S. Army has been testing, uh, uh, being, being a, not, noticing the amount of multiple sclerosis they got from the people who lived in the southern part, closer to the equator in the United States, versus far away from the equator. There used to be about a 20 to 1 difference in the amount of people with multiple sclerosis who were volunteering to be coming. Uh, become soldiers. That was the case up until about 40 years ago. Then air conditioning came along and people in the southern part of the United States were no longer having to get too hot in the summer and because they're able to stay inside with the air conditioning. And now it's just about level in the United States. The same amount of people volunteering to go into the army from the Florida, which is the closest to the equator, versus Maine, which is the furthest from the equator in the United States, they have about the same level of multiple sclerosis versus it used to be, you know, uh, an order of magnitude difference between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, New Zealanders uh, watching this uh, as we kind of discussed multiple sclerosis from uh, incidence rates from uh, a United States perspective, uh, you know, you can do a simple Google search and reveal the data for uh, MS incidence uh, rates in New Zealand. And uh, the data is pretty starkly clear uh, that incidence rates increase the further south uh, you go yes. uh, in New Zealand. Uh, and um... I, I've got maps like that for lots of countries. A very good one I can remember from, from the UK that down in London, they got a certain level of multiple sclerosis, but up in Scotland, it's, I think it's five times higher. Uh, but the same sort of thing happens in various places, but some of that goes away, that differential as you get more and more air conditioning. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and look, as we kind of move on to a, a summary and philosophical uh, section, I uh, the first question, question I wanted to ask you, and, it's, and again, I'm a weird dude, I think about strange things. Uh, I've always wondered uh, about astronauts. You've worked in the aeronautical uh, space before. Uh, the colonization of, of other planets and vitamin D, uh, is this something these guys are even thinking about? Uh, to astronauts, for example, that are working up at the uh, ISS supplement vitamin D, do you know? Um, <laughs> NASA, for a long time with the people up at the International Space Station gave the people no supplement whatsoever. Then they finally got around to the only supplement they gave to the astronauts was vitamin D. 
And then I went, and then they're finding that they're increasing the amount of vitamin D that they're recommending to the astronauts. Uh, I went through a calculation and, uh, okay, it costs a lot of money to have an astronaut up there. Uh, the commute charge is really expensive and, and the supply chain and everything else is really expensive such that it, it, I've forgotten the exact numbers, but it's of the order of $100,000 a day to have a person up there. So I went through a simple little calculation um, about a year and a half ago and looking at how much more productive the uh, astronauts would be in terms of running their science experiments, which is kind of the reason for being up there, how much more productive they would be in not having colds and flus and feeling better, et cetera. And it was a huge, just fantastic amount of money that they could save or increase productivity uh, if they gave them uh, an adequate amount of vitamin D instead of, I think it's 600 IUs is it, what they were originally giving them. Uh, and, uh, you know, the problem here uh, uh, on Earth, it's not, it's not just uh, relegated to the folks working uh, that science up at the uh, International Space Station. You know, uh, the metaverse is something that uh, I'm hearing about more and more. Uh, yeah, alongside Elon Musk's aspirations to uh, colonize other planets. Uh, do you think uh, innovators of our 21st century, like Mark Zuckerberg, uh, have considered vitamin D and their process, uh, you know, looking at the metaverse where we exist uh, virtually with a headset on? Uh, what would be your message to him? You have increased productivity and health of people, no matter where they are, whether they're uh, uh, shut-ins and not getting outdoors at all, if they're elderly, they're astronauts, anywhere else, that as a single supplement to be given, vitamin D would help a tremendous number of people wherever they are, under the water, uh, in, in the Antarctic, they're finding the vitamin D helps also, by the way. Um, it just helps tremendously in lots of different places. Uh, we talked about uh, domesticated animals and the fact that you've got a veterinarian section uh, on the D wiki, which I know some folks are going to head over and check out. Now, uh, I, I've spoken about Dr. Gomenak uh, previously, and I think one of the things she eloquently talks about uh, is the migration, hibernation, uh, or the living off reserves uh, in relation to vitamin D, uh, the sun, and the uh, animals uh, and the creatures that live on the earth. I, I think this is really interesting. Can you just talk about the equator uh, and those three aspects, you know, hibernate, migrate, live off reserves? Not too well. I don't have that much information about it, unfortunately. I, I would be interested, by the way, I haven't looked for it yet. Uh, I would suspect that you will find for cluster headaches that there's been a great increase in the incidence of cluster headaches since the 1950s. Uh, and that vitamin D is perhaps a major cause for that happening. Uh, there's a couple of other things like zinc and uh, magnesium that may also be, and omega-3 that may uh, be there that uh, there's been some changes in the, in the, since then, but vitamin D is a, a primarily, a primary item. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, like I said to you before the interview uh, started, uh, I mean, I've had, um, I just have so many people reaching out to me uh, here in New Zealand regarding uh, cluster headache. Uh, it'll be something that I uh, look up in terms of incidence rates and uh, maybe blog uh, post uh, in future uh, about that. But um, you know, it, it leads me to asking uh, you, Henry, wh what's the way back for us? It, it's almost like, um, and I'm sure the viewers, if they've you know, followed and kind of grasped um, the idea of why we're deficient in vitamin D, uh, what's the way back for us as a species? You know, what needs to change uh, in order for us to wake up uh, and realize that we are living so out of whack uh, with nature that we're so off course, you know, phil philosophically speaking, doesn't, doesn't this leave you with a, 
I guess, a sense of melancholy as to uh, where our species is at? Uh, it's beyond melancholy. For quite a few years while doing vitamin D wiki, I thought, oh, if they just got a little bit more proof to the doctors, they would see that this is, seems to be something which is useful to do. But I've come to the conclusion starting about four years ago that no, the you need to follow the money or see who's going to benefit from it. Uh, and if you're adding vitamin D, the health people do not benefit from it. They will decrease the a number of jobs that they have. Oh, one local example in Australia, they're uh, near to New Zealand. Uh, they, they noticed that there was a 10 times increase in the total I use sold to uh, Australia over a period of 10 years, a 10 times increase. This is not due to the doctors doing it, but they found that there was a 30% decrease in the number of osteoporosis visits after that 10 times increase in vitamin D. We're seeing some of that happening at the grassroots level around the world. Um, the, the, I mentioned there about multiple sclerosis, the, uh, the blacks getting multiple sclerosis, they greatly increase their vitamin D levels. Same thing happening with Parkinson's disease. Uh, I've got that documented that people who are getting Parkinson's without their doctors recommending it or looking on the internet and other places and saying, hey, this might help me. Uh, and they're taking a whole lot more vitamin D. Unfortunately, not quite enough to, to make a big improvement, but it does help them somewhat. That, that's going on and on through many diseases. Uh, generally, where the looking at the people or the groups the individuals who benefit from it, they are doing it. The people who don't benefit from it, the, the health insurance companies, the uh, hospitals, the doctors, uh, many times they have negative reasons for going ahead for taking vitamin D. So I've get, kind of given up trying to convince the health professionals and focusing now more on, uh, as you are, as having the individuals consider it for themselves. Mm, and mm. for some people, my son, for instance, uh, he's <clears throat> much younger than I am. Uh, he took the extra vitamin D and he didn't notice any difference, but he's also younger. And as you get older, your vitamin D levels get down, get worse and worse. And, uh, and he did, he wasn't having any health problems at all. Uh, excuse me. He did have one health problem. He was having allergies and all the allergies have gone away now. It's yeah. Uh, allergies to uh, pollen, for instance, mm. but he doesn't particularly acknowledge that particular item. But uh, so my recommendation is, uh, as I have here on slide number 20, uh, start by restoring your vitamin D levels with four pills and do that for a couple of months. And at the end of that couple of months, decide for yourself, did that help me? If it didn't help, then don't continue on with it. But if it did help, which is in most cases what will be the case, then go ahead and proceed on as I have on the page here of uh, adjusting your vitamin D level as to what you actually have. Mm, mm. Um, tell me, you know, sharing this information uh, isn't without its perils. Uh, have there been any challenges uh, over the years in terms of getting this information out there and, and censorship? No, there's not been, uh, there has been extreme censorship on some of the uh, COVID-19 uh, alternative treatments like ivermectin. There's been uh, calling it a, uh, the, the horse uh, the dewormer yeah. uh, is a particular outrageous thing because actually it's just 10 times the number of humans get uh, ivermectin as do horses. But mm -hmm. uh, doesn't yeah, really, matter. <laughs> uh, yeah, really interesting that uh, that whole topic, and we're, we're certainly not going to uh, not going to wade in, into that debate. But um, uh, look, I'm really interested to hear uh, where to from here uh, for the wiki. Uh, have you got any exciting projects uh, or developments on the horizon? 
the one that I had given myself a New Year's resolution uh, for January 20th was to get some employers. I, I've got all the documentation of how much, if they gave free vitamin D to all of their employees, how much more productive the employees would be that they would not be out with colds and flus, would not be sharing the colds and flus uh, to with their other employees, uh, would feel more productive and alert, et cetera. I've got some pretty intense documentation showing that that would, it would save quite a lot of money. Uh, not ex Just ignoring the decrease in cluster headaches, migraine headaches, and, and other things. Just some very simple, basic things but then COVID came along and I got distracted by that. I'm hoping to get back to it soon, uh, as pointing as, that out. But I figure it's going to take quite a lot of effort to do that. Uh, I think, yeah, uh, best laid plans at times, uh, Henry. We certainly got thrown a curveball, uh, and it appears it doesn't matter where you live. Um, none of us kind of got off uh, lightly in terms of the disruption to normal life. Now, uh, there's a ton of good videos out there uh, or and interviews on, on vitamin D. If there was one that you would recommend to folks uh, that need, um, that want to watch something else, what, what would that be? Um. I've got a, uh, my website's got listed, I think, 120 videos concerning vitamin D. Uh, in terms of a very short one, I think the one we produced uh, five or six years ago was pretty good. I've shown you the case there with the 80, nano, 80 nanogram, uh, the, the doctor that got the 80 nanograms and uh, so many fewer people, but it describes in there the details about how you get vitamin D from the sun and uh, and the health problems associated with having low vitamin D, et cetera. So, yeah. so that's a nice five minute summary. I'm calling that the best five and a half minute video uh, on the internet. Hands down, it's one that you will want to share with your friends when you see it. Uh, it's on the wiki. It's linked uh, on my uh, channel. Uh, go and watch it after this. Uh, you'll thank, thank me later, I assure you. Um, finally, uh, Henry, what would be your message to someone that is new to this, that's watched the video, um, that may be dealing with one of the conditions um, that, that we've kind of touched on. Uh, where to from here for that person? It's kind of, the, this is the summary one of that. If you think it's going to help, do not just try a certain amount, whatever amount on a daily basis, because you will lose interest in trying that on a daily basis because uh, humans just don't notice the, the it, it takes a while for it to build up in the body normally, but go after it in terms of like getting a, uh, a good suntan or being out on the beach and going on a sunny vacation, consider that. But instead of going on a sunny vacation, you only have to take one pill every two weeks. And that is a little tiny pill that is very easily consumed with your meal. If you don't like taking pills, you can even open up the cap, many of the capsules and just pour it into your food or your drink and take it that way. It's totally tasteless. Uh, and then just do that for a couple of months, or I mean, excuse me, uh, you start with the restoring and you should feel better, get your own personal feeling, doesn't make you feel better in a couple of weeks. And then if it is, we'll continue on doing that, the one pill every two, two weeks for a couple of months and then fine tune it by getting a vitamin D test and saying, oh, is it likely that I could, you know, okay, the vitamin D test says I'm at 30 nanograms and I should be at 50 or 80 nanograms, but, but I'm still feeling good. So maybe I need more, but also, maybe to the point of, oh, I'm feeling really good and, hey, I'm at a high level of vitamin D. I don't have to continue at this level. I can drop down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anything that we've talked about uh, today uh, that you've seen, if you're watching this, uh, Henry has very kindly uh, linked all of this information in one page. So uh, you can go to the section where we, for example, uh, talk about uh, cluster headache, click on the link uh, and go and view the literature 
uh, on the vitamin D wiki. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add, Henry? Uh, yeah, but it takes about another 10 hours. So <laughs> this is sufficient. There, I was thinking about all of the other things to, that could be talked about, but at a certain level, I think this deals with the, uh, uh, what people can try for themselves and, and look up for your particular health problem. I've got a hundred and some, maybe it's 120 or 30 now, health problems listed on the left-hand column. And look at if for a particular health problem you have or that runs in your family and take a look and see what the studies are actually showing. Um, being an engineer, I am extremely data oriented. So I don't really like to look at um, people's hints or ideas or, gee, this individual found that XX helped them. I, I, I take very little interest in that. In fact, for a long time, uh, I've taken the policy of if I come along with a single study on a particular disease that's finding vitamin D helps, I don't put that on the website. Just from a single study, I don't trust any single study. There's so many things could be right with it or wrong with it. But I generally will start to put the study on the vitamin D wiki after I've seen five studies and at least three of them say that vitamin D is a significant help. Mm -hmm. I'm allowing yeah. that there will be some disagreements. Uh, generally, rarely will it say that the vitamin D hurts. Uh, there are one or two that's, that they claim, I'm not too sure about it, uh, that the vitamin D got the problem worse, but generally it's saying, hey, they added the vitamin D, nothing helped. But oftentimes when I look at them, yeah, they added 500 IUs of vitamin D. One of them added 30 IUs of vitamin D and it didn't help that particular problem. And so they say vitamin D doesn't help at all. And so you uh, will not find a study like that on your site. So you're looking. Uh, you'll find at, a couple. I just for flavoring, I throw a couple of those in uh, each month of the ridiculously small amounts or small durations that a, you know, they'll run a test in which they'll give a good amount of vitamin D, but they'll run the entire test will be over in one month. At which point, vitamin D level will not have even gotten up to the, the, the maintenance level that is needed. And they'll say at the end of that one month that oh, vitamin D didn't help with this particular problem. Mm -hmm. There are and, lots, of, lots of trials like that. And so it's somewhat assuring then that I know um, the collection you've got there is somewhat curated uh, and the papers have been viewed uh, with a, you know, with an analytical, uh, critic, the critical eye that you would expect uh, from yes. so someone that's been an uh, aircraft engineer uh, his, uh, for his working life. Uh, look, Henry, uh, as a person that knows the wiki uh, inside and out, I, you know, bless you, uh, sir. Uh, for the work you uh, are doing there. I know uh, it comes at a cost of time. Uh, and I also know that you've uh, invested uh, a lot of your own finances uh, in getting the message out. So uh, I am absolutely certain that you will be uh, kindly rewarded uh, when you approach those pearly gates uh, many, many years from now. Uh, if you've been watching uh, the show uh, uh, you like and subscribe we'll have more from Henry Lahore uh, the links uh, in the description uh, and uh, go and visit the vitamin D wiki it is just a sensational a sensational place Henry my good man thank you yep bye